Well, greetings to everyone on the live streaming and out there in uh, internet land, if you want to call it that, and those that are not able to be with us, but they are with us, uh, just as they were sitting in one of the seats here, but through the internet, they can partake of the services, and we're so happy to have them with us, because there are many people that are around the country and the world that you know, aren't able to sit in Sabbath services because of distances and because of many different reasons, whether it's health reasons or whatever it may be, but hi to those up there in uh, Halifax, and I think uh, our brothers and sisters over in Jackson area usually visit with us on the internet, and others around, and we don't know where they are, but you're welcome to the services. You know, we live in a world where there's very little honesty, very little integrity, and very little respect. You know, we see it around us every day, each and every day of our lives. We have to deal with the world that we live in. And it seems like each day that goes by, and each week that goes by, that it's getting worse and worse. You know, the idea almost that, uh, you know, you're breathing some of my air, so you better get out of my way. And man does not have any concern for his fellow man. You know, I remember years ago, and I remember myself as a young man, uh, I was pretty handy with mechanics and automobiles and stuff. If somebody was broke down the side of the road, I'd stop and help them every time. Or I'd give them a ride or whatever. But in the society today, what has happened and what we see happening in our society today, I'm very cautious. And I'm really sad that I have to be that way. You know, that you really would want to have that open heart of care and, and try to help somebody. But we've heard of these horrendous situations where somebody tried to help somebody, and they pulled a gun on him, shot him dead. Maybe took his wallet with 20 bucks or whatever he had. You know, it isn't worth it for me uh, to do that. And so I've kind of shied away from that because of the way our world is. Now, our society thinks and they teach that lying is a way of life. I mean, lying, you can tell a lie, it doesn't make a difference what you tell it to or who you tell it to. If it benefits you, it's okay. And that's the way they live. I mean, look at our television. I don't know if any of you watch television very much, but if you watch any of these television programs, some of these sitcoms that are on the programs at evening or stuff, they teach lying as being a way of life. You know, they, they continually lie throughout the whole program. Children are lying. Children are no, they're teaching their children to lie, showing disrespect to one another. It's I mean, it's just getting to the point where... I don't even want to watch television much. There's nothing good on it. I like the game shows a little bit. But, you know, some of these sitcoms, and that's the way our world is. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, lie, lie, lie. They all laugh about it. Lie, lie, lie. And it's full of that. The other thing that troubles me a lot about our sitcoms and our television and the world that we live in, and I may get in trouble for saying this, but I don't care, is a homosexuality and the stuff they call gay. Every program that they have out there has to have some kind of a gay person in it. Almost everything. And what does God say about that? Read Romans 1 once and see what God thinks about it. Now, it's despicable to God. It's an abomination. And our society thinks it's funny. Oh, it's a way of life. You know, embrace all this filthiness, as I call it. And it just turns my stomach, basically, you know. I watch it. And I wonder why I do. You know, sometimes it's funny and laugh a little bit here and there, but uh, I guess I need to come to the point in my own life, and maybe you need to come to the point in your life that to ask you the question, you know. Would our Savior Jesus Christ sit here and watch something like that? You know, the abomination that's on the televisions or on programs or in movies. You see all these tapes that come out about movies, you know, the, the little segments about what this new movie's about. And 90% of it is demonism and Satanism. It's all untrue. It's all this high sci-fi stuff or whatever you want to call it. You know, latest one, what was it? Uh, the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Yeah. Yeah. Now you tell me that ain't Satanism? 
the Sorcerer's Apprentice. And oh, they'll flock to go see this thing. And there's been thousands of them like it, and they're getting out, like almost every movie that's out there is connected with that type thing. But you know, lying, you know, what's wrong with it? Everybody does it. You know, they come to the point where they think it's just a way of life. You know, not a problem at all. The information that we receive every day of our lives predominantly comes from where? Comes from the media, doesn't it? Predominantly from the media. I don't know if you're listening to radio or television or whatever you're listening to, internet, I don't care what it is, but it's the media. That's where our information comes from. And it tells us about what's happening in the world. It tells us what's supposed to be happening in our local area. Right where we live, what's going on, what's happening. And none of it's good news. Most of it's all bad. You know, somebody's burned house down, or burnt this out, or they killed this one, or they killed that one, or they raped this one, or they raped that one, or they did this with this little child. There isn't any good news out there. But we get everything we understand and see that comes from the media. What's happening in our state, our county, our country, all the things that are around us, it all comes from the media. Well, how much of it can you really rely on? You know, how much can you rely on? How much of the media is truth? How much do they tell that is truth or not truth? How many times do they lie? <laughs> you can't hardly believe a word they say, basically. Politicians, now there's one. Lawyers, another one. You know, lawyers will try to get a murderer from being murdered if he stood right there and watched the guy kill him. And he'll lie through his eye teeth in a court of law to get that guy off when he could have stood right there and watched him kill the individual. That's just the way of life they are. That's the way our society is. So there's no truth out there. You know? So can we trust what we're told in the media as being facts? Can we trust it as being truth? Let us turn to John, the 8th chapter. John 8. Here God inspired John to write this. And the whole Bible is written for our admonishment and for our understanding, for our edification. John verse eight, chapter 8, verse 44. John 8, 44. Jesus said this. You are of your father the devil. He's talking to the Pharisees, Sadducees here. And he says, the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he abode not in the truth. But there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. Satan the devil is out here to destroy mankind. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And Satan is the one who deceived Eve at the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. Satan is the God of this world. And he's the one that is out there making everyone in this world think that, oh, it's okay to lie. Boy, if you ever look up the word lie and study in the word lie of what God says about lies, it's really high up on his maybe list of some of the worst things you can do. Lie. God hates liars, and it's abomination to him. In 2 Corinthians, speaking of Satan, and Satan being the father of all lies, in 2 Corinthians, tells us here, in the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians 4, and verse 4, he says, In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan is the God of this world. And how much can we believe and, uh, and trust in as far as the media or the knowledge of the world or in the world or what the world has to say? Can we really trust it? You know, when you listen to TV and you hear all these things about what's going on in the world, this golf spillage, for instance, in the golf. 
They're only telling you what they want to tell you. They're not going to tell you the truth about it, and they don't tell you the whole ramifications of it. And there are some information that you can receive about what's really going on there. You know, they talk about putting this new cap on there, and the news was on there last night. You know, they're going to cap her down. Boy, they're going to get her right on down there. You know, it's only been about 85 days now, and they finally decide, well, we're going to put this on there, and that's really going to take care of it. And we're supposed to believe that. We're supposed to believe it's going to take care of it. Never once, and I mentioned this the other day too, uh, a week ago or so, never once have they ever mentioned in that golf incident about that well, how much pressure that well has. Not once do they mention anything in the media or anything else Nobody has any idea what the pressure of that well is a mile deep in the ocean that's blown out of the center of the earth. Why don't they reveal that? <laughs> you know, if they had to reveal the truth about it, then you could calculate about how many millions of gallons of oil are going into the Gulf. And they come up with all these cockamamious ideas, well, we're getting 25,000 barrels a day, and we're doing this, and we're doing that. 37,000 or 37 million barrels of oil is supposed to have been dumped out there and they recovered 670,000. Oh, isn't that great? 37 million and they haven't even recovered one and they want us to believe that that's just wonderful. You know, the pressure in that well could be so substantiated that they aren't going to be able to cap it. I don't know. We'll see what happens with this next so called thing, you know that they're trying to do, that they want us to believe they're going to handle it. Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah writes here, and he talks about trust. Jeremiah 17 and verse 5, he says, Thus said the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in a man. No truer words have ever been spoken. He says, Cursed is the man that trust in a man. Jeremiah 17, 5. And he says, And make us flesh his arm, and his heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath, heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabit it. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. You know, blessed is the man that trusts in God. Now, the world wants us to trust in them. Our politicians want us to trust in them. They want to be elected to rule this country. Really, they don't want to rule the world if they could do it. If they could be elected as a world ruler, that's what they really want. You know, one world ruling government, one world ruling order. How many times have you heard that over the past 10 years, for instance? A lot of times in the media, a lot of people that are elected in, in the high offices of the countries of the world, they're talking about one world rule, ruling order, a new world order. But he says, cursed is the man that trusts in a man, and blessed is the man that trusts in God. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see them heat that uh, cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from the yielding fruit. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? You know, we as human beings, as Jeremiah says here, and God inspired him to write it, are basically wicked people. You know? Our carnal human nature is not for God. Mankind wants to rule itself, and God has let him do it for almost 6,000 years. And look what's happened to the world we live in. You know, I'm not that old. You know, that time goes, I say I'm not that old. You know, 70 years ain't very old. Time flies through that 70 years. Now, when you're 20, 70 years look like, oh, man, he's older in time, you know. I thought one of those thoughts when I was younger, too, I thought that way, you know. 
thought I was King Kong and nothing ever going to happen to me. Man, I could do all there was and all this stuff and no matter what, you know, did before God called me, I didn't need no God. I'd take care of it myself. Well, that's what the world is thinking. And basically, that's what the world lives by. You know, they're going to care all the problems themselves. Our medical profession's got a pill for everything going to man, and they're going to cure everything that we got. No, they're not. You know, when it comes down to the bottom line, what is it? It's all for greed. It's all for money. That's all it is. Well, the heart's desperately wicked. And he says, I, the Lord, searcheth the heart. I try the reins even to every or to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. God searches our heart. You know, I really thank God for that. Hebrews 4, verse 12, I think, is this other verse. If I quoted it right. Where he searches the heart. You know, the intents of your heart. And I thank God that he does that. Because if he searched our minds and our heart is connected with the mind so to speak but if he really searched what's in our minds and what we think and what we do and all the different thoughts we have and all the evil things that we have each and every day that go through our minds I think he would basically just spit us out and say forget that forget that you know we wouldn't have a chance just like Dave said about I can't remember which one of it was but a chance of a snowball you know, that was my dad's favorite saying, you know, they got a chance of a snowball in hell. And they believe that hell was a f hell fire, you know, hotter than anything you've ever seen and uh, comprehended by man. Well, you know, a snowball wouldn't last long in a blast furnace. And that's what people think hell is, a blast furnace, basically. Well, we know that hell is the grave. You know, that's where hell is. It's the grave. Well, 2 Corinthians, let's turn to see what Paul had to say. We're talking about trust today. 2 Corinthians. The first chapter of 2 Corinthians. Chapter 1. We'll pick it up in verse 9 of chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians. He says, but we have the sentence of death in ourselves. Well, how true is that? We have the sentence of death in ourselves. We can't save ourselves. Flesh and blood is going to die. No way around it. Ever since man has been created, flesh and blood dies. I don't know anybody who's 500 years old. Some people make it to 100, which is a fantastic thing. But we all die. Flesh and blood dies. And he says, you know, in ourselves, if we rule ourselves and look to our trust in ourselves, we have no hope. You know, really, we have no hope. We're going to die. And we could die a spiritual death if we're not careful. We could. And he says that we should not trust in ourselves, he says, right there. We can't trust in our own selves. Well, who can we trust in? You know, the world wants us to trust in them. Our leaders want us to trust in them. Our local governments want us to trust in them. Our families want us to trust in them. Our children want us to trust them. Our mates want us to trust one another. But we got to remember who we are. We're carnal human beings. We're desperately wicked people. And when things get to the certain situation, can we really trust one another? In some cases, you you'll have to ask yourself the question, I mean, can we even really trust our mate? The world we live in today, they're killing each other. Husbands and wives. You know, we need to think about what trust is. But in God, which raises the dead, is who we put our trust in. We can trust in God, Paul says here. 
who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, in whom we trust that we will yet, or that he will yet deliver us. See, God will deliver us from everlasting death. He has made a promise to each and every one of us, and to all those that will hear his and believe in his word and follow what his word tells us, the way of life that we walk in, he'll give us all an opportunity. And if we're faithful and trust in him, we have that opportunity of eternal life. But we can't kid ourselves and think that we can lie through life to each other or to whatever or trust in the world or trust in the lawyers or trust in the politicians or trust in any man at all and think we're going to be okay. No, we can't. There's only one that we can trust in. And David had a special relationship with that one that we can trust in. Let us turn to Psalms 31. Psalms 31. And when you read the Psalms, and I would recommend you to read the Psalms. I'm not saying you have to start from the front to the back, but these few chapters here that we're in talking about trust. If you've got a strong concordance, look up the word trust. And just read a little bit. And read the chapters. Not just the verses that have trust in it. But read what... Try to read and understand what is going through the mind of David when these psalms were written. Chapter 31 and verse 1, he says, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thy ear to me and deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for a house of defense to save me. Who else can we rely on to save us? Are we going to lie, rely on the United States of America, the government of the United States, to save us? Are we going to rely on any person or any man to save us? It's so disheartening to see the churches of the world and what they're teaching. See, they teach that as long as you contend to go to their church and believe in their way, that, well, you're going to die, when you, and when you die, you're going to heaven. You know? You're going to that promised land when the Bible tells you fully the opposite. See, the churches of the world aren't keeping church today, are they? We can go down to, there's probably a thousand of them, <laughs> By the time we went to one end of 28th and the other, I might exaggerate a little. I like to do that. Maybe not a thousand, but there's a lot of churches in the city of Grand Rapids. And there's some big, huge churches, five or 6,000 members. And they don't even know the truth of God. And they're not even taught the truth of God. Their ministers are ministers of Satan, as the Bible tells us. They're not teaching them what the Sabbath day is. They're not teaching them about who Jesus Christ is. They're not teaching them about death, about the resurrection, about the kingdom. Teach them when they go to heaven, they go to the kingdom, I guess. That ain't what the Bible teaches. That is not what the Bible teaches. He says, For thou art my rock and fortress, therefore thy name's sake lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net that I have laid privily for myself, or for me. For thou art my strength, he says. Unto thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God, of truth. I have hated them that regard lying vanities. You know, tell us to hate them that lie. And if somebody comes and tells you a bald-faced lie, whether it be one of your children, grandchildren, a brother, a sister, whatever, and you find out that it's a lie that they told you, how much trust do you trust the next time they tell you something? You know, when they break that trust, it probably, in most cases, can never be replaced to the point that it was before they broke it. Now, they may be able to heal some of that in time. As time goes on, things can be healed. But you still never have that deep trust that you had before they lied to you. 
So God tells us, you know, it's better to tell the truth. He says, I hate those lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord, David says. You know, David was a man after God's own heart. The Bible tells us that. Now, a man after God's own heart, I think, from what we read in the Psalms and what we know about David and his life and so forth, that I think that he had a very close relationship with God. God was with him. Even through all the mistakes he made, through all the sins that he made, God heard his prayers. And God will hear yours and my prayers also, as long as we continue to develop the strength in God that comes through trust in God and being faithful to him. Verse 13 of that same chapter, 31, chapter 31, verse 13, he says, For I have heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side while they took counsel toward against me. They devised to take away my life, but I trusted in you, O Lord. I said, you are my God. He says, my times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemy and from them that persecute me. Make thy face to shine upon your servant. Save me from, for thy mercy's sake. Let me not be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon you. Let me, the wicked, be ashamed, and let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. You know, people are going to laugh at you, aren't they? They think you're a nut, number one. They don't really respect us as they ought to. And that's what he's saying here. You know, the lips of the lying. They don't want to be, you know, I found that out, and I said this before too, and, and talking about friends and kids I grew up with, young men, you know, in the 20s and so forth, when God called me. They didn't want nothing to do with me after I began to walk with God. I'll never forget that. I've said this before. Close friend. First time he sat down to dinner with us, and I bowed my head to pray. I'd never seen him the next day ever after that. I had never seen him to this day. I mean, that's 45, 50 years ago now. They don't want nothing to do with anybody that wants to obey God. They don't want anything to do with God. And that's the way the most of the world is today. Most of the world, I mean, a lot of the world, I shouldn't say most, but I think of the younger generation, as each generation passes on, that they become less and less to know who God is and don't want anything to do with God. And I dare say that most of them don't even believe there's God. A large majority of the society that we live in. He says, oh, how great is thy goodness which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, or fear me. And that fear isn't an awesome fear. That fear is respect, an awesome respect to who God is. Those that fear the Lord with reverence. He is the God who made all things. Take a big breath. Where'd that come from? <laughs> you know, the world thinks, oh, it's always been here. Always will be here. God is the one that gave you that breath, and God gives it to me, and God is the one who sustains it, and God sustains this earth. And when his time comes, this world is going to be having such a world of, of awakening, a rude awakening, that they are, you know, they're going to think it's some alien from outer space. That's exactly what they're going to think of. And they're going to fight against this alien. Yes. Yet they won't have enough power to even put a dent in this alien. They won't even be able to scratch him, so to speak, or his saints. See, they have never come up against a power like this. They can't even conceive it. I can't conceive it. You can't conceive it. The tremendous power that God spoke with his voice 
And it was done. Genesis 1, read it. When he created the earth. Let us make man in our image, he said. And he knelt down and he made man out of the dust of the ground. And then he breathed the breath of life into him. We can't even conceive that kind of power. And man think they can go against God. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of the man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in the pavilion from the strife of tongues. Blessed is the Lord, for he has showed me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard my voice of my supplications when I cried unto you. O oh, love the Lord, all you his saints. For the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentiful rewardeth the proud doer. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that have hope in the Lord. Look at what David's writing. Look at his attitude. Look at his mind. How he thought that God, you know, that God was way far, far from him. That because of his wretched sin that he made, that, you know, God wasn't even going to hear him. Yet he knew that God heard him. You know, he's telling him, you heard me. Chapter 32, verse 1, he says, Blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not the iniquity. Verse 6, For this shall every one that is godly pray unto you in a time when you mayest be found. You know, let all of us pray to God when there's a time, and the time is now when he can be found. And God speaks in verse 8, and he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you shall go. I will guide you with my eye. A tremendous promise from God. That he will guide us, that he will direct us through his Holy Spirit. He will teach us the way that we should go. Be you not as the horse or as the mule which has no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with the bit and the bridle, lest... They come near unto you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, he says. But he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy for all you that are upright in your heart. Shout for joy before God. Thank him for his tremendous blessings that he gives. Chapter 33, he continues on, and he says, verse 1, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with the harp, and sing unto him with the psaltery and the instrument of the ten strings. Sing unto the Lord, or to him, a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise, for the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness, and he judges the earth as full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth up the deep in the storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. And that fear is reverencing the God of the maker of all mankind in the world. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. You know, the oceans have a high tide and a low tide, and they come in and they go out. They never come beyond the high tide area that, they, that God made them, and they only go out to this so far, and then they come back. Think about that a little bit. You know, what if God hadn't put a restraint upon them, for instance, and they just kept coming? You know, they'd wipe off the whole state of Florida, for instance, right off the face of the map. They're surrounded with water. You know, but God, you know, says, okay, they come so far. What he said is done, and what he commanded is done, and they go back. He's an awesome God. And I think we need to try to relate a little deeper in our minds about who he is and what he has done. 
For he spake and it was commanded, The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught, and he maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever in the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. And this nation was at one time the most blessed nation on the face of the earth. But they lost their blessing. They turned their back on God. They walked away from him. And he's not blessing them anymore. We have earthquakes in diverse places. We have tornadoes. We have hurricanes. We have all kinds of weather situations that are destroying our nation. And now we got oil out here in the Gulf. And what if a hurricane comes through and sucks all that oil off the surface of the land and dumps it on our heartland of the crops of the heartland, for instance? You think that's impossible? I don't think so at all. I pray that God doesn't allow that to happen. We'll be hurting. Big time. But we've turned our back on God. The whole nation has turned their back on God. Drop down to verse 18 of chapter 33. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him or respect him or awe him and reverence him, upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in you. You know, David had that special relationship with God. He meditated on God's law day and night. He tells us that. He was in constant contact with God. Is God a part of our life every day? In our thought process, do we have God in our mind? Well, let's say continually. I don't think there's times when you're not going to have him in your mind. You know, can, but when you're riding down the road in your car, there's a lot of time there to meditate. You know, when you're working your job, I can understand you're busy, 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 and you're not thinking about God at that time. Or some of the other chores that we have to do in daily life. But there are a lot of times during the day that we can reflect on God. David said, I meditated on his law day and night and his ways. You know, is God that part of our life every day like it was in David? See, David had that deep trust in God. He put his whole self and his whole being into God, in trusting God. His strength in God came because of his deep trust in God. That strength that we need to strengthen our trust in God. David had that trust and that strength in God because he trusted him. We need to develop that same trust in God ourselves, as David had. When we read about the Psalms and read about the life of David and the relationship he had with God, he had a deep, deep trust in God. When troubles of life come down our way, What's the first thing that we do? You know, do we put our trust in God or do we first, as I said earlier, try to handle ourselves? You know, I don't, no matter what it is, you know. When situations come upon us and confront us, whether it's uh, personal relationships uh, or family relationships or whether it's uh, uh, problems with the automobile or anything, I don't care what it is. Do we ask God first to help us with the problem? Or do we kind of forget God entirely and just bowl right into trying to handle it ourselves? You know, my morning prayer lately has been this. God, help me to have a good day. Help me to have a good day. You know, I know he hears me. And it always helped me have some good days. But I tried to ask him right in the beginning of the morning to help me have a good day. You know, don't let me get upset with something or don't let something interfere in my mind so much that it uh, kind of overwhelms me. You know, help me have a good day. 
But if we try to handle it ourselves, in most cases, we're going to fail. You know, we're going to beat our heads on the, on the wall, so to speak. We may be accomplished a few things, but Jesus told us to put all our cares upon him. You know, he cares for us. You know, when we try to handle ourselves, the first thing we should do is pray to God. We should give it to God first. And if we think that we're going to trust in the governments of this land for the needs to take care of us, I think we need to think again. And I hope we don't put our trust in the government and the land and, and, the, and the rulers of this world because, as I said earlier, it's, it's Satan's world. Do we put our trust in them that they're going to tell us the truth? You know, you have to sift through every piece of information that you get, no matter what it is, and see if you can pick out the little tiny bit of truth that might be in it. You know, when they're in their mouths, there is no truth. We can't trust our fellow carnal mind or our fellow man. Brother, we can't even trust ourselves, as Paul said. He says, let alone we can't trust someone else. Like I said, it's Satan's world. In Satan, in him, there is no truth. Revelation 12, 9 tells us that Satan is the deceiver of the whole world. And he is escalating his destruction of the world and mankind more and more each and every day. Let's turn to 1 John. 1 John... The second chapter, 1 John 2. And we'll begin reading in verse 15 of 1 John 2. John writes and he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world will pass away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God will abide forever. We can't put our trust in the world. We can't put our trust in the things that are in the world. We can't put our trust in fellow man. We can't put our trust in ourselves. We must put our trust in the only one that we can trust, and that is God. God who cannot lie. He is faithful to keep his promises he has made to each and every one of us. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. Christ and God have not changed since this book was written. And there hasn't been any new chapters written to it in my lifetime. All that we need to know to live and walk with God are written in these pages. And it's unfortunate that the preachers of the world don't teach the people of the world how to live and what God wants them to live. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, walk in my way. There's only one way, and that's God's way. You know, we must put our faith and our trust in God. We must strengthen our trust as never before in God. You know, David developed that special relationship with God. He was very close to God. And when you read about David, you'll understand what I'm saying. And we read some today about it. But in 2 Timothy, Timothy writes in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1, he says, Know this, that in the last days perilous times shall come. When these perilous times come, who are we going to trust in? He says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. 
Timothy wrote about our society right here out the door. Right out the side of this door. The world. And when these perilous times come, who are we going to trust? There's only one that we can trust. Strengthen your trust and put your trust in God.